If I were to ask you, what's your dream car? What do you want in your dream car? You're gonna access a part of your brain that's speculating. You're gonna guess. But if I were to ask you, think about the car you're driving right now. What's one thing about your car right now that kind of bugs you a little bit, that's annoying, that frustrates you? Most of us can pick out what that thing is. And it gives us a clue on the types of questions that you want to ask to understand your market, to understand your audience at a deep emotional level. And the ask method is all about the nuance of asking the right questions in the right way to the right people to understand your audience and who they are. So you can not only better sell, but more importantly, better serve. And that's what the ask method is all about. Man, my kids will never have to work as hard as I did. And two or three decades later, these people would come in after their adult children had moved back in a couple of times, <laughs> and they would say, Doug, I don't even know what's wrong with my kids. They don't even know how to work. Mm -hmm. And I would say, You're saying, personally, you've never owned a Roth IRA, a traditional IRA, a 401k. Right. Now, tell us why. Because Money Revealed is an exclusive video series where self-made millionaires share their secrets on how they got rich. In this episode, you'll learn how to become your own boss, avoid financial mistakes that keep you poor, and what is Einstein's eighth wonder of the world. These are the lessons that they don't teach you in school about making money. And we've partnered with the series creator Jeff Hayes to bring it to you on my YouTube channel. Enjoy. Brian Lebeck is a legend in the internet marketing world. He's the best-selling author of the book, Ask, and this book revolutionized how digital marketers approach their businesses. Now he's got a new book out called Choose, and you should not start a business until you read this book, or at least watch this interview and read this book. And if you're in business now, this interview is something that's gonna help set you up for greater success moving forward. Enjoy this interview with Brian Lebeck. Brian, thanks so much for being here. It's good to be here with you today. Tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do. So we have a company where we teach entrepreneurs how to launch and grow their business. And it's based on my own personal experience launching businesses in 23 different markets. So we have a best-selling book that's called Ask, a book that's called Choose that helps you identify what market you should go into and how to start the right business for you. Perfect. So tell me, were you born an entrepreneur or how'd you come to this? I definitely was not born an entrepreneur. In fact, I tell people I'm one of the most risk adverse entrepreneurs that you're ever going to meet. After college, I grew up, my dad worked for the government. He worked nights. He was a shipping clerk. My mom was cutting hair in the basement of our house. So I grew up very blue collar. I was the first person in my family to go to college. I was fortunate enough to get into an Ivy League school and I studied neuroscience. So my parents thought I was going to go on to become a doctor, which was like the safest path that you could follow. Um, I decided to go into finance instead. After college, I worked on Wall Street for the investment bank Goldman Sachs, and then I eventually made my way to China. And I started working for the financial services company AIG. And I was opening up offices for AIG across China. And I was living out of hotels, I was on an airplane every single week, and I was burnt out. I was in my mid-20s and I have, had what I call a quarter-life crisis. I said, there has to be a better way. My wife and I were married, but we had this bi-country marriage. She was in grad school in Hong Kong. I was based out of Shanghai. We'd see each other once or twice a month. And I said, I want to do something different. And it led me to this path of building a business so I could live life on my own terms. I, said, I told people, I said, listen, I don't want to live my life in a box, traveling in a box, to work in a box. I want to be able to build something that gives me freedom, gives me the ability to make an impact, and someday, leap legacy. So I'm assuming it was smooth sailing once you made that decision, right? The first business that we launched ended up being a complete failure. And it's one of the lessons I teach entrepreneurs that I work with. And it's the importance of not going into a fad market. So the first business that we started was in the tiny obscure market of teaching people how to make Scrabble tile jewelry. So my wife, at the time, this is 2007, 2008, stumbled upon a website which was brand new at the time, a website called Etsy.com. If you're not familiar, it's a, a site that's like eBay for handmade goods. And at the time, it was a brand new site. And she stumbled on this jewelry that was selling like crazy that involved using Scrabble tiles and origami paper. And she said, hey, honey, we can do this. We're in China. There's all the origami paper that you could want in the world. We have access to inexpensive labor. Let's manufacture this jewelry and let's import it into the United States. 
And I said, honey, I don't want to do that. That's going to tie us to a factory in southern China. We want a location independent business. We want to be able to travel and live life on our own terms. So she said, okay, put it to bed. A few weeks later, she reaches out to me again and she says, look, remember that Scrabble tile jewelry thing? And I said, I thought we closed the door on that thing. She says, no, no, time out, time out, time out. There's this woman. She's not selling the jewelry. She's teaching people how to make the jewelry. And the cool thing about Etsy is that you can look at a person's sales history. So you can see how many sales someone's making every single day. And we did the math and she was selling this tutorial for $25 and she was making 20 to 30 sales a day. We did the math, I said, that's like $15,000 a month and it, it's all profit. She's just selling this PDF, like we can do this. And so we bought her product, it wasn't terribly good. Said, we said, we can build a better mousetrap. We built our own tutorial. My wife learned how to make the jewelry. We took photographs, we did the, the text, we started selling it. First month we made $1,000. $2,000, $4,000, $5,000, $9,000 a month. We said, we're going to be rich. Like, this is, this is great. This is, going to be, this is going to be great. And it wasn't that much longer after that that the worldwide Scrabble tile jewelry market crashed. It turns out the whole thing was just a fad. People stopped buying the jewelry. So everyone selling the jewelry wasn't making any money. People stopped buying tutorials on how to make the jewelry. And before we knew it, we were basically broke. I'd quit my job. My wife was in grad school. We're living in a 400 square foot apartment. We had that moment where we looked at each other and we said, now what? What do we do now? And we decided to move back to the States and start over. Mid 20s, late 20s at this point. We had two suitcases. We moved to Brownsville, Texas, the poorest zip code in the country, about a mile away from the Mexican border, which is where my wife grew up, where she was from. So we wanted to be close to her parents. And we started over. We started our first real business that did go on to become successful. So I know what it's like having those ramen noodle and bologna sandwich days. I know what it's like on a, you know, $50 a week food budget. I know what it's like having bars on the windows and a mattress on the floor. I know what those days are like. And I find that's one of the things that holds people back from going after it. People want to know, do you have to give up good in order to go for great? So it's obvious after hearing that story why you would write a book called Choose, but we'll get to that in a second. From the time I've known you and heard you speak, a part of your depth comes from a significant health challenge that I think also colors your perspective. Tell us about that because I want the people who hear you to understand like I do that this is a deep well that we're dipping into, not a shallow well. So after we launched that Scrabble Tile jewelry business and it was a failure, we moved back to the States and I launched my first real business that became successful, which was in a random obscure market teaching people how to care for their orchids, as in the flower. And we took that business from nothing to $25,000 a month in 18 months. My wife quit the job that she was working at the time. We go all in, take that business to half a million dollars a year. But I thought it was a fluke. Like I thought it was just a, I was so scared that the same thing was gonna happen again. So I decided to diversify into another market to make my parents happy that I was actually using my education from college. We went into the how to improve your memory market. So we started teaching people memory techniques. So we went into that business, took that to half a million dollars a year. Well, before I know it, I was going into market after market. I went to 23 different markets, which is, which is crazy. Um, and at that time, my first son was born. And right now, you see me on camera right now, I'm about, you know, 185 pounds, 190 pounds, um, in pretty good shape. But after my son was born, I started mysteriously losing weight. Again, I'm running these 23 different businesses. I'm a new dad, I'm losing all this weight, and I'm tired all the time. At the time, I just chalked it up to being a new dad and trying to run a fast-growing company. But my wife insisted that I apply for life insurance. She said, you're you know, responsible for someone else's life now. Apply for life insurance. So I did. Apply for life insurance, and I go away on a trip, come back, and there's a letter waiting for me on my desk, and it's from the life insurance company. I open up the letter, and the letter says, denied. I just turned 30 years old, denied life insurance. Now, if you're denied life insurance, typically it means something serious is going on. So I call up the life insurance agent, and if you fly to, for life insurance, you know that they do a medical exam. I didn't have the results of that exam, but the agent did. So I talked to him, and he said, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I think you want to sit down. And he proceeded to give me the numbers from my lab results, and I, I wrote them down. And then I tell people I made the biggest mistake of my life. I went to Google. I went to Google to find out what they meant. And I typed in my numbers into Google and they came back, kidney failure, renal system shutdown, and pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is like a death sentence. 
And so I'm freaking out. And I remember that night my wife asked me, she said, I saw we got the life insurance letter, is everything okay? And I said, well, not exactly, we need to talk. So she starts breaking down and schedules a doctor's appointment the very next morning. Now at this point, I was in denial. I thought that they had messed up my results with somebody else. I thought somehow the results got um, swapped. So we go to the doctor the next day and they draw blood. They do some lab results. They say, we're gonna order this stat, hang tight in the waiting room, we'll order this right now. And I remember when the doctor came back out in the waiting room, he re comes to me, grabs me by the shoulders and he says, Mr. Levesque, you should be in a coma right now. We're taking you to the emergency room. So they rush me to the ER, spend 10 days in ICU, in intensive care. I've got a six month old baby at home. I'm thinking to myself, I don't wanna die. And it turns out I was an undiagnosed juvenile diabetic. I had type one diabetes and I was one of these guys in my 20s, I never went to go see a doctor. I lived in China for five years, I never saw a doctor when I was living in China. So I'd just gone undiagnosed all these years and it, my body had reached a point where it was shutting down. And so I emerged from that experience and I said, if I wanna do something with my life, right? If I wanna do something with my life, now's the time to do it. And I'd had this financial success in all these different markets and I'd worked hard to get there, but what I realized is that I, I wasn't impacting a large number of people. I had something here that had worked for me and it transformed my family's life. Listen, I grew up blue collar. I grew up, you know, my parents didn't go to college. Um, I grew up as, as working class as it comes. And I've been able to build this great life for myself and I wanted to share that with people who wanted to do the same thing for their family and make a difference in the world. And so that's why I published my first book, Ask. And I revealed what I consider to be my secret family recipe, which is how I had success in all of these 23 different markets. And that's the path that started the company that we built. And we've got 60 employees and hundreds of thousands of people have read our books and millions of people around the world have now followed this process that we now teach entrepreneurs on how to have success in your business. So let's stay in your book, Ask. The people who are taking your courses, what do they learn? So whenever I bring up this topic of ask, people say, well, is it as simple as just ask people what they want and give it to them? And the answer is not exactly. See, the process of asking questions is a bit counterintuitive. You can't just ask someone, what should I sell? How much should I charge it for? And then deliver it because people don't know what they want. In fact, you've probably heard the quote from Henry Ford. You know, he's famous for saying, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses. Steve Jobs is famous for saying, people don't know what they want, until you show it to them. And the reason why those statements ring true is because they are true. People don't know what they want, but they do know a few things. They do know, for example, what they don't want. In fact, if I were to ask you, you know, what's your, what's your dream car? What, could you, what do you want in your dream car? You're gonna access a part of your brain that's speculating. You're gonna guess. But if I were to ask you, think about the car you're driving right now. What's one thing about your car right now that kind of bugs you a little bit, that's annoying, that frustrates you? Most of us can pick out what that thing is. And it gives us a clue on the types of questions that you wanna to ask to understand your market, to understand your audience at a deep emotional level. And the ask method is all about the nuance of asking the right questions in the right way to the right people to understand your audience and who they are. So you can not only better sell, but more importantly, better serve. And that's what the ask method is all about. I remember when that book came out, I probably had a dozen friends recommend it to me. It was a really useful book for entrepreneurs, but now you have written what appears to be a prequel to that book. So what's a new book and why was that needed? So when you write a book like Ask, one of the great things that happens is you get a bunch of letters, emails, messages from people who tell you how much the book has changed their life. But you also get messages from people who say, I read the book and it didn't work. I tried what you teach and it didn't work for me. And when I got letters like that, it frustrated me. It pained me because I put my blood, sweat, and tears, my heart and soul into that book. And as many entrepreneurs as this worked for, there were people that used the methodology and didn't have success. And so I wanted to get to the bottom of that. And it started off, it kicked off what became the biggest research project of my life. And I started looking at what were the reasons why people were failing? What mistakes were they making? Where did I go wrong? Did I leave something out? And what I found is it all came down to one thing. People were choosing bad markets. There's a metaphor that I use in my teaching and it's like this, you know, when you start a business, it's like deciding to throw your raft in a river. 
Now, you're building your business because you want to take yourself to some destination, whether it's achieving financial freedom, making an impact, leaving a legacy, changing your life and the life of your customers. And so that river is the thing that's gonna get you to that destination. Now, you can have the best boat money can buy. You can hire the best crew. You can buy the best equipment. You can row 18 hours a day. But if that boat is facing the wrong direction, or worse yet, you throw that boat into a river that doesn't have any water in it, or a river that's gonna swallow you up whole because it's just too big, you're never gonna get to your destination. And that's what I found is that people were choosing bad rivers. And so I asked myself, I said, what if I could teach people how to find that hidden river? The river that was just right. The river that's gonna take you to exactly where you wanna go. And so I embarked on this research project and I looked at each of the 23 markets that we went into. I studied every single one of my clients and students and looked at what were the factors that separated the businesses and markets that were successful compared to the ones that failed. Now I'm a huge fan, I was inspired by the work of Jim Collins, who's written Built to Last, Good to Great, Great by Choice. Now Jim Collins' work centers around studying the most iconic companies in the world and what separates those that have been successful for decades from those that failed along the way. And I wanted to do the same thing for our small niche businesses. What was it that separated them? And what we found was that there were seven factors. Seven factors that when you get these things right, you're setting yourself up for success. Every single one of our most successful businesses checked off these seven boxes. The ones that failed were missing one of these key ingredients. And that is the subject of this book, Choose. Okay, so obviously I have to know, what are the seven factors? So when it comes to choosing the right market and starting the right business, there are seven factors and I'll talk about a few of them right now. So one of the things that we discovered is that every single one of the most successful markets have what we call the five market must-haves. These are five factors that if you wanna be successful, you wanna make sure your market has. And I'll go through them. The first is what we call an evergreen market. Now an evergreen market is in contrast with a fad market. Evergreen market is a market that was relevant 10 years ago, and it's a market that'll be relevant 10 years from now. Recent examples of fad markets, in my experience, I share the story of my Scrabble tile jewelry business, that's how I learned that lesson the, the first time, but a lot of people have experienced this recently. So fidget spinners is a perfect example of a fad market. It took over the world and then disappeared off a cliff. Another one that a lot of people have been affected by is the Bitcoin market. Now there was a time recently where you could not turn a corner without everybody talking about Bitcoin and building businesses around Bitcoin, membership sites and online programs and exchanges. And you saw the price of Bitcoin skyrocket and then fall off a cliff. Now, one of the things that you can do is you can use a tool called Google Trends. Now, Google Trends is a tool that Google puts out to analyze the keyword volume of keywords. So how many people are online searching for information on Bitcoin or fidget spinners? And you can see the global trends. Is it going up? Is it cyclical? Is it going down? Or is it stable? Now I learned the hard way what happens when you go into a fad market. They go up, but then they fall off a cliff. And so some of the markets that are evergreen markets, markets that have been here for, they're here to stay, are markets like orchid care, markets like leadership skills. You're looking for things that are gonna be relevant, that are gonna fuel your soul and fill your bank account for years and years and years to come not something that's gonna be here today and gone tomorrow, so that's the first thing. But being in an evergreen market, turns out, is not enough. You also want a market that is an enthusiast market. Now what that means is, in contrast with a problem solution market, you want a market where people are consumers in that same space for years and years. So an example of a problem solution market would be something like the, the, the flood removal market. Like if you have a flooded basement, you call up a company, they help you get rid of that flooding damage, and then you move on. There are no clubs, there are no Facebook groups, there are no newsletters to subscribe to, to you know, stay in that world. In a problem solution business, you constantly have to chase after a new customer. Versus an enthusiast market, you can acquire a customer once and sell to that same customer over and over again. So an example of an enthusiast market would be something like guitar. Someone learns how to play guitar, they wanna be in that market for years. They're buying music, they're buying instruments, they're buying equipment. Dogs is another great market. 
So if you serve dog owners, you get someone who brings a puppy into their home and then they buy all the things you, you know what it's like when you buy, uh, 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 you know, if you've got a dog or and know anybody who has a dog, you've got um, doggy bowls, doggy treats, doggy crates, doggy clothes, doggy Christmas ornaments. I mean, people spend crazy amounts of money on their pets. Um, the market serving entrepreneurs is another great example. People who are entrepreneurs tend to be entrepreneurs for years and years and years. So those are examples of enthusiast markets. But it's not enough to be in an evergreen and an enthusiast market. You have to solve market must-have number three, which is an urgent problem in the context of that evergreen and enthusiast market. What do I mean by that? Well, if you go into the doggy market, for example, you can't go into that market and expect to have a ton of success if you're going to sell something like doggy mugs, right? Nobody wakes up in the middle of the night and says, honey, we got to get this doggy mug tonight, tomorrow. What you're looking for is what we call a $10,000 problem, a burning problem that people need to solve right here, right now. An example in the dog market would be a dog peeing on the rug. You bring a new puppy home and the dog pees on the rug, pees on the sofa, pees on the clothing, pees on the bed. It reaches a boiling point where you say, enough is enough. We've got to solve this thing now. A story I share in the book is Dana Obelman and her husband, they help parents with young kids get their kids to sleep through the night. That's a perfect example. If you've ever had young kids at home, you know what it's like when you're trying to get some sleep and nobody's getting any sleep in the house. That's a problem. That's a $10,000 problem. So that's market must have number three. Number four is a market that has what we call future problems. Now, when you solve that first $10,000 problem for someone, you have this opportunity to become their trusted advisor for life. If you help someone, if you're the dog whisperer and you help someone get their dog to become potty trained, the only question they have is, hey, my dog's barking. How do I get her to stop barking? Or my dog's pulling on the leash. How do I help her with this thing? What you're looking for is a market where you have, when you help someone become successful in that first thing that you help them with, that success leads to a new problem. So in the entrepreneurship market, we'll take that for example. Once you choose your market and decide what business to start, the next question that you might be asking is, well, how do I figure out what to sell? Then once you have success selling that product, you might be saying, I'm doing all the work myself. How do I hire my first employee to get some help? So every level of success leads to a future problem that you have the opportunity to solve. So that's number four. Number five is what we call PWMs. So I first learned this phrase from the late, great Gary Halbert, who's largely regarded as one of the greatest direct response copywriters of all time. Now, PWM stands for players with money. You want to find a market where you have people who spend a disproportionate amount of their income in that area of their life. Now, it's not to say you're selling to billionaires or millionaires, but you're looking for an area that people spend a disproportionate amount of their money in that, that area. So for example, golf is a, is a classic example. If you know anybody who plays golf, they spend crazy amounts of money on golf equipment, golf instruction, golf trips, uh, vacations, and so forth. Wine is another great example. People who are fans of wine will spend a ton of money in that area of their life. Dogs, another great example. If you have a dog, I mean, gosh, our little four and a half pound chihuahua, the amount of money we spend pound for pound on that little girl is incredible. And so you're looking for something like that. You're looking for evidence of PWMs. So evergreen market, enthusiast market, urgent problem, future problems, and PWMs. That's great. Okay, even as you're going through this, I'm thinking of some of my own businesses and thinking A plus, A plus, C minus. So those five things were just one of the seven. Tell us a couple of more. So the five market must-haves are one of the characteristics, and I'll give you a couple more. So one of the things that we also did when we looked at each of our businesses is we looked at the keyword volume in each of those businesses to analyze market size. And what we found was one of the most striking discoveries of my entire life. We looked at all of our successful businesses, and we found that the keyword search volume, in other words, the size of the market as measured by Google Trends, a free tool, was all within a very narrow range. And every single one of our failed businesses was either too big or too small. And so one of the things that we debated literally for months is we said, should we reveal what those keywords are? Should we reveal what our most successful markets were and what those keywords were? 
What we decided to do in the book was reveal it all. We decided to share exactly what those keywords were so you could take your keyword in your business and measure it against those benchmark keywords and see if your business is either too big, too small, or right inside what we call the market size sweet spot. So that's another one of the factors. So just for someone who's watching this that might not know, explain what a keyword is. So one of the things I teach is the importance of identifying what's called your bullseye keyword. Now your bullseye keyword is a keyword that describes the thing that people would be searching for online that represents the transformation or process that you help people through in their business. I'll give you an example. One keyword would be orchid care. Orchid care represents the bullseye keyword in our orchid care business because we help people care for their orchids as in the flower. Another example, memory improvement. We help people improve their memory through a series of techniques and courses that we offer that are designed to train and improve your, your memory. So those are examples of bullseye keywords. They represent words that people would type into a search engine like Google that represent what they're looking for help with that represents what you help people with in your business. So when we looked at all of our bullseye keywords in market after market, we studied all of our clients' businesses and we looked at what was it that separated those that were successful against those that were not successful, we found that market size was incredibly important. When it comes to tossing your boat in the river, you don't want a river that's too big because you're gonna be swallowed up whole. You don't want a, a river that's too small because there's just not enough current to move you forward. You want a river that is just right. And in the book, we reveal exactly what that size is. So that's market size. Now another factor that I think is really important is this conversation around competition. Now competition is interesting. When I talk to people who are at the stage of just starting their business, trying to figure out what business to go into, inevitably it leads in one of several directions. People have an idea, they get super excited about it, so they go online, they do some searching, and they say, crap, somebody's already doing it. They close the door to the idea. Or they come up with an idea, they go online and they say, nobody's doing this. We're going to get rich. This is great. And the reality is both of those situations are problematic for different reasons. One of my mentors taught me this phrase that's always stuck with me and I'll share it here. And he said, you know, Ryan, remember this. Pioneers get shot, but settlers get rich. What he meant by that is you do not want to be the first to market. You don't want to be the first one to try to sell something or figure something out online. If nobody's doing the thing that you're thinking of doing, chances are with the seven, eight billion people on the planet, listen, you're not the first person to have that idea. Chances are someone else tried it and wasn't able to make it work. Instead, what you're looking for is this. If you look at the most iconic companies of our time, you look at Google, you look at Facebook, you look at Apple, none of them were the first to market. Google was not the first search engine. Facebook was not the first social media platform. And Apple was not the first to sell smartphones or MP3 players. Instead, what they found is they found a market that was proven and they either built a better mousetrap or they did a better job with their messaging and marketing. So the secret is this. You want to find a market where your competition is succeeding in spite of itself. That is the secret recipe. So especially from your vantage point where you have not only your own experience, good and bad, but also your clients right. and all the people that you've worked with, You've got a pretty good view, so how does someone choose their business as there's a pretty big market to choose from? When it comes to figuring out what type of business to start, a lot of people I talk to get overwhelmed because it feels like there are a million options out there. You know, do you start an e-commerce business where you're selling physical products online? Do you open up a physical storefront? Do you set up a restaurant in your local town? Do you build an agency where you're helping people with something like social media or marketing or photography? It feels like there are a million options out there. But in my experience, I've found that there's one business model that I recommend starting with, and it's selling education and expertise. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the education and expertise market, what we mean by that is selling everything from books, courses, to doing coaching, consulting, to live events and virtual events, to building membership sites online. Here's a crazy stat for you. Did you know that over $450 million a day is spent on education online? Courses, books, ebooks. Isn't that crazy? Half a billion dollars a day. 
Now, the reason why I love this model so much and I advocate it, especially if you're a bootstrapped entrepreneur, meaning you're funding your business yourself, which was me. I funded our business with $5,000 in savings. That's how I got everything going to build a $10 million a year business, is because when you sell education and expertise, the margins are incredibly high. If you sell a course online, a digital course for $100, for all intents and purposes, that's $100 in profit. Versus if you sell a $100 watch or a physical product, you might only make $10 or $15 on that $100 sale. So the margins are incredibly high. Startup costs, incredibly low. You can just use your iPhone, start filming yourself, and you have the makings of your own course. You don't need expensive equipment. You don't need to fly to China to go to manufacturing facilities and build prototypes and deal with import-export. Have inventory and stock where you've got a warehouse worth of stuff. You could create the thing today and start selling it tomorrow. Now, whenever I bring up this idea of education and expertise, people inevitably say, I don't have any expertise. What about, what about me? Well, I'll answer that a few different ways. This is another thing one of my mentors once taught me. He said, Ryan, remember this. To the fourth grader, the fifth grader is a genius. Think about that. You don't need to be a PhD or have that level of expertise to teach somebody else something. Think about it. If you've ever had someone reach out to you and say, hey, can you help me with this? Can I ask for your advice on this? You don't necessarily need to be a world-class expert in that space. You just need to be one or two steps ahead of your students, your clients. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this. If you have no desire to be the expert yourself, there's a world of experts to partner with, to hire. Let's take a look at what we're doing right here, right? We're talking, we're bringing on world-class experts in the form of this project right here to talk on their area of expertise there's nothing stopping you from doing something just like what we're doing right now. So whether you have expertise or don't have expertise, whether you have a desire to be an expert or not, education and expertise, over $450 million a day being spent online. You know, I think about how much this is exploding. When I went to college 15, 20 years ago, cost of college that I went to was $40,000 a year. Same college today, over $80,000 a year. It's an exploding industry right now in all areas of the world. So I advocate that type of business above and beyond anything else. Let's go up a level. One time I was asked a question, can entrepreneurship be taught? And the answer was yes, as long as you're teaching it to an entrepreneur. Do you think everyone should do this? How is it broken down for you? So when it comes to deciding if this is the path for you or not, here are a few things that I know. I know that right here, right now, over half of all American adults, over 50% of every American adult wants to be their own boss, wants to do their own thing, wants to be in control of their own destiny. Whether or not they have the capability to do that or not, I know if you to talk to two people, one of them wants to do it. The other thing that I've learned along the way in my research and literally working with thousands of entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs, many people who are just like me, where I was a few short years ago, working in a cubicle, working in a job, having a daily commute, and wanted a better path for my life. Wanted to do something more. You know, I was at that place where I felt like I had more to give. I felt like there was more to me to contribute. And I felt like that I was living in this box and I was constrained and I wanted to take a chance. I know there are a lot of people out there that are in that situation that they feel there's gotta be something more than this. And that's exactly where I was. And I found that when it comes to virtually all people who desire to launch their own business, there are four types of entrepreneurs. The first type of entrepreneur is what we call a mission-based entrepreneur. Now, mission-based entrepreneurs typically have a mission that they're drawn to. They have a wrong in the world that they want to right. They have a cause that they would die on a hill for. It might be eliminating cancer. It might be eliminating bullying, but something negative in the world that they want to fix. Now, the mission-based entrepreneur is in contrast with the passion-based entrepreneur. Now, passion-based entrepreneurs have something that they love, that they want to move the world toward whether it's playing guitar, whether it's watercolor painting, whether it's fly fishing. They've got something that is a passion of theirs that they want to turn into a vocation. Now we've got mission and passion based, but we also have just opportunity based entrepreneurs. Now there are many people in this world that don't have that mission they die for or that lifelong passion that they want to make into their vocation. But they're the type of person who looks around and says, how is it that nobody's solved this problem before? They're entrepreneurs in the most classic sense of the word. And the fourth type is actually my type, which is the undecided entrepreneur. 
There are a lot of people that know they want to be their own boss, start their own thing, but they look around and they say, I just don't know what I should do. That's the exact situation that I was in when I launched my first business. And the tip I'll share with you if you're an undecided entrepreneur is this. Start with a practice business. If you think about when you first learned how to drive, most of us didn't learn how to drive in our dream car. We learned how to drive in an old beater that could get a few scratches on it, get a few dents on it. But in that journey, we learned the process. We learned the skill. And just like with starting with a practice business, you can learn the skills to get things off the ground. Learn how to ask your customers what they want. Learn how to create your first product. Learn how to build your website and write emails and do things like Facebook and Google and all the skills you need to acquire to build your business. And then with that, that can transform eventually into that business that is a passion of yours. When I first went into the how to teach people how to care for their orchid business, the orchid care space, I knew that wasn't my mission. I knew that wasn't my passion. It wasn't an opportunity that was tremendously powerful, but it was a practice business for me. Now, heck, that little practice business went on to make half a million dollars a year, so you never know where your practice business is going to take you. Now, what's interesting about each of these four types, and I invite you as you're hearing me describe these to think about which one best describes you. Maybe you're a combination of more than one, but each one has a light side as well as a shadow side. So mission-based entrepreneurs, be aware of what your shadow side might be. Mission-based entrepreneurs tend to struggle with charging money for what they do. They're so passionate about their mission. They're so passionate toward helping people that they struggle actually selling. Passion-based entrepreneurs tend to be blind to the fact that the thing that they're passionate about may not be something that has opportunity to profit from. In other words, they're fueling their soul, but they're not filling their bank account. Opportunity-based entrepreneurs struggle with finding something that can make money, but they have no love for it. It's a hollow process. There's nothing that there's drawing them to, to it. And so over time, they can lose passion and interest in it and wonder, why did I start this in the first place? And the undecided entrepreneur struggles with analysis paralysis, overthinking things, struggling to come up with what that thing is and constantly staying in that, that, that space of brainstorming and talking about it and thinking about it, but never actually taking action. So it's a process that begins with self-discovery. It begins with understanding yourself, understanding who you are, so you can ultimately move forward and build a business that will serve you. I love this framework and I love that you added the shadow side to this. It's so important. Kind of in that vein, you and I have seen people flame out, but we're here in your home and you have a long-term marriage and kiddos that you are raising and you seem to have figured out the balance in the equation. What advice would you have for someone who's on the entrepreneurial journey who gets tugged in too many directions and is out of balance? For someone who's in the middle of their entrepreneurial journey, I would say a few things. Number one, don't compare your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 11. I think there's an epidemic where we see success. We see people putting their front stage out there on social media. You see the absolute best of what's going on, but you don't see their backstage. You don't see the hard yards that they've walked, that they've run behind the scenes, right? I've got two kids. I love my two boys. They're my world. I've been married for over a decade. I've been with my wife for nearly 20 years. We call it sweethearts. We met freshman year of college. We've been together. We started our business together. We've been through the hard years, the ramen noodle and bologna sandwich days with the mattress on the floor, living in an apartment with bars on a window. So we've been through it all. She comes from a family of immigrants from Mexico. Her grandmother came to this country, could not speak a word of English, could not read or write. She went on to get a PhD. So there is a lot of work behind the scenes to make something like that happen, and you don't see it. One of the things that I've learned along the way is if you have someone that you've identified as a mentor, the key is this. Don't necessarily study what they're doing right now. Study what they did when they were at the same stage you're at right now. So don't study what Mark Cuban is doing today. Study what Mark Cuban did when he was living in a car and he was trying to make his first sale. That's what it takes. That's the secret. And so don't compare yourself to what you see out there. And when you're studying a mentor, make sure you study them in the right way. That's terrific. Let's wrap with the spiritual side of this. I like the thing that drove you further was your desire to share and lift people up. Would you speak to that as far as building an entrepreneurial income and the impact that could have? So I think for most entrepreneurs, I can certainly speak for myself, there's this this interesting duality. In many ways, I'm driven by impact. But the shadow side that I'm self-aware enough to know about is that I've always had a challenge with feeling like I haven't measured up. 
and I talk about this in my book. I share stories growing up how I was doing the spelling bee. When I was in fourth grade, on a whim I decided to do the spelling bee. Competed against all the fourth graders. Then I won all the fourth graders. I competed against all the fifth graders. Beat all the fifth graders, sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders. I'm nine years old. I beat everyone in my school. So I go to states. Nine years old, competing against teenagers. I spell perspicacity. I spell cerulean. Third round comes up. My word? Sandal. I messed it up. Screwed up on sandal. I tell the story in this book where I played soccer. That was my sport growing up, playing soccer. Captain of my high school soccer team. I get recruited to be in this ODP, Olympic Development League. I play this, I make three rounds of cuts, make this Olympic Development League, squeak onto the team. First game, I sit the bench. Second game, I sit the bench. Third game, I sit the bench. 18 games, I don't play a minute. So I've constantly struggled with this feeling of succeeding at one level and not succeeding at the next level and not measuring up. Whilst at the same time, knowing that I have something that I want to give, right? I shared this with my two boys. At the end of the book, I have a letter that I wrote to my two boys. And I asked my publisher, I said, can I include this letter? Because I think it's so important. And in this letter, it's advice that I want to leave to my boys. And I say, listen, entrepreneurship is not about measuring up. Entrepreneurship is all about one thing. It's about momentum. It's about progress, not perfection. It's about enjoying the ride. It's about moving forward in spite of that fear. My parents taught me one thing that has stuck with me more than anything else. They didn't go to college, they didn't have successful businesses, but they taught me one thing. They said, all you need in this world is two ingredients, courage and grit. Courage is about doing the things that scare the crap out of you in spite of that fear. And grit is picking yourself off the ground when you skin your knees, because you are gonna skin those knees. So in this letter to my boys, I share some advice and two things that I share with them is this. Leave it all on the field, but more importantly, live and love fully. And what that means is give it everything you've got. Leave it all on the field, but even more important than that, if you're focused on the future, if you're focused on that next milestone, making a million dollars, having your first million dollar day, those days, they come and go. In a moment, they give you satisfaction. But if you want to do this for the long term, it's about momentum. Leave it all on the field, live and love fully. And that's how you build a business and a life that lasts. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much. I'm sure you got a ton of value out of this interview with Ryan Levesque, but there's more. We had recorded him reading a letter that he had wrote to his son, and it didn't really fit for the interview, but it was so moving and so powerful, we wanted to add it as a bonus for you, and you can watch it right here on this page. So enjoy that. And as always, thank you so much for being with us through this journey. Next up, we have my interview with New York Times bestselling author, Doug Andrew. Doug Andrew is a financial advisor to the rich and famous, and my interview with him took me by surprise. Why? I had spoken to many financial advisors over my years as an entrepreneur, and the advice that he gave was pretty much 180 degrees opposite of what I heard in the past. But as he gave the advice, as he was talking about his strategies, it became apparent that he was 100% right, and I had gotten bad advice before. So I want you to lean in and listen to what Doug Andrew has to say. He gives this advice to very wealthy and famous people, and now he's about to give it to you. Doug, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. A lot of ground I want to cover, so I hope you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. Thank you. Good. Uh, you know, there's so many things you know about in the realm of financial strategy, and uh, I, I think it's going to touch a lot of areas that we delved into in this particular series. So let's just start with you first, though. How did you get into the type of work that you're doing? Wow. Way back, um, about 50 years ago, mm -hmm. my intention was actually to become an estate planning attorney. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a means to that end, uh, when I was at Brigham Young University, I got my insurance license and my Series 1 securities license to sell mm -hmm. mutual funds and stocks and bonds and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't even offer that license anymore. It was the granddaddy of them all. Mm -hmm. And so part-time, I went out and began to meet with clients, um, prospecting door-to-door -door and what have you. Even though it was tough, mm -hmm. um, it ended up being something I fell in love with. Mm -hmm. In fact, 
I made 30 grand uh, part-time my first year as I was a student, and I was in my junior year. The next year, I think I made 72,000 or something, and I think the professors uh, were, were making 40,000 at the time, and, <laughs> and I went into the dean, and, he, and my wife had been in the hospital in intensive care, had some serious surgeries, nearly passed away. Mm -hmm. In fact, technically did twice and came back. Mm -hmm. And so we ran up all these medical bills. So I had to put uh, college on the back burner a few times, and I supported myself in the hours that I did have by going out and meeting with clients, helping them to optimize their financial assets. Mm -hmm. Well, he said, how much could you make if you were full-time? Mm -hmm. I said, oh, 150, 200 grand. He goes, what are you doing in college? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, I went out and I fell in love with it. I've never looked back. And uh, I have been so blessed, Patrick, rubbing shoulders with some of the top uh, entrepreneurial uh, financial gurus um, in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned a lot by osmosis. Yes, I went and got mm -hmm. my, my schooling and all those degrees, but really I learned more from rubbing shoulders with brilliant minds. Mm -hmm. And so you started on that track, you got out of school, you know, went full time. Uh, you were obviously earning a lot right out of the gates. Uh, did you, if you look back on that now, did you know what you were doing back then? <laughs> Actually, I take a lot of pride mm -hmm. in uh, not recommending anything to mm -hmm. anybody that I didn't own myself mm -hmm. or that I had not uh, uh, sort of tried and proven. And so, yeah, I probably didn't know what I didn't know because mm -hmm. you can't be aware of something you're not aware of. Right. But um, what I was able to do is help people gain a lot of clarity. And of course, I felt more comfortable at first mm -hmm. with younger people. What's so funny, Patrick? Mm -hmm is uh, half of my career, I couldn't wait until people would stop asking, are you old enough to know what you're doing? You know, <laughs> I thought, when am I going to finally be old enough to, so they don't ask that question? Right. That uh, sweet spot lasted about one week, uh -huh. where I was, I guess, the perfect, because uh, when I hit that midpoint, all of a sudden people started asking, are you going to be around when I retire? <laughs> but um, I gleaned a ton going through and helping some very high net worth people yeah. and picking their brains and then also becoming part of many mastermind groups. Yes. So is there an overriding philosophy to what you do? I mean, you know, that you'd say, you know, this is just my, the lens I look through that kind of drives everything. Yes. Um, most of what I do is not termed conventional wisdom, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and I help people optimize all of their assets on their financial balance sheet, mm -hmm. but also their family balance sheet. And that's what probably makes my approach unique. Mm -hmm. My company is called Live Abundant. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is... Uh, for a lot of years, Patrick, people would come to me uh, to optimize their financial assets and minimize taxes. I'm a tax strategist, right. and I've saved people you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of unnecessary tax uh, for causes that they support for their own family and what have you. Now, when these people would come in, oft times I would ask their background, their story, mm -hmm. and how did you uh, create this legacy of financial assets? Mm -hmm. And they would tell me, oh, I, you know, I learned, I grew up after the Great Depression and worked hard and mm -hmm. went from rags to riches. And they'd mm -hmm. say, man, my kids will never have to work as hard as I did. Mm -hmm. And two or three decades later, these people would come in after their adult children had moved back in a couple of times. <laughs> and they would say, Doug, I don't even know what's wrong with my kids. They don't even know how to work. Mm -hmm. And I would say... Maybe you stole that from them. Mm -hmm. Maybe in your effort to help your children, or now your grandchildren, you're actually hindering them. You're enabling them instead of empowering them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would do a double take. They'd say, well, what can I do? Because if I were a physician, I probably spent most of my career curing different types of diseases. Mm -hmm. Now. The word dis-ease means you're not at ease, right. dis-ease. And we, we think of that physically, right. okay? But people have a lot of financial dis-ease, mm -hmm. and they follow the herd. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, when they're thinking about money, right. they're going out there, and many times they follow the herd, and they just uh, almost get duped, 
I think, mm -hmm. into, uh, oh, just sock away money in traditional tax-deferred IRAs and 401ks mm -hmm. because you're going to be in a lower tax bracket when you retire. Right. Huh. That has not been true or axiomatic for over 25 years. Do you know, Patrick, uh, it took the financial services industry until uh, just three years ago to finally admit that's been the wrong advice? Wow. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you know what a fiduciary is? Mm -hmm. Okay. A fiduciary is supposed to uh, look out for their client's best interest ahead of their own, okay? Right. And what bothers me sometimes is a fiduciary will hear the client uh, say, yes, I'm doing very well, and, and I'm socking away all this money, and I've got a million or five million bucks, and, but now I'm going to retire. Uh, I'm not in a lower bracket. I thought that was the premise. Right. They're in as higher, higher tax bracket as they've ever been in. And so they go, what, what, was that good advice? Was that, were you looking out for my best interest? Why, why didn't we do something different? So what I would help a lot of people do is cure the tax disease or that corner they painted themselves into to get their money out with the least tax consequence and convert it at least up to 60% of their mm -hmm. retirement resources to uh, vehicles that are tax-free, mm -hmm. that are immune from the dangers of taxes, inflation, and market volatility. Yeah. Well, so now uh, there's a lot of topics to talk about, but we're on taxes, so let's let's look there. Okay. Uh, because you know, for the let's say the average professional, somebody you know who earned higher than uh, you know, let's say the the minimum income or the the middle income is, but they they made some money. They're professionals. They're doctors. They're lawyers. They're accountants. They're they entrepreneurs that have earned, etc. Um, one of the things I've noticed after decades of being an entrepreneur, is that really trying to accumulate wealth is difficult because you have to pay taxes. And by the time you try to live any kind of a lifestyle, right, you raise some kids, maybe put them through college, and you pay your taxes, it's yeah. really hard to, you know, the taxes are very oppressive to wealth accumulation. So what do you think some of the tax strategies, you know, for people out there looking for them, what are some of the, you know, maybe what's some of the low-hanging fruit? What are some things that they can get themselves into that would be worthwhile? Yeah, very good. When we're talking about uh, the money we sock away for long-term goals like retirement, mm -hmm. okay? So let's talk about that one. Many times, again, people think, well, I want to use hundred cent dollars, pre-tax dollars mm -hmm. to contribute into a traditional account like an IRA or 401k. Mm -hmm. Now, sounds good, uh, but let me use this little metaphor. If you were a farmer, Patrick, and you had the choice of buying your seed in the springtime, mm -hmm. and you didn't have to pay tax on what you paid for your seed. Mm -hmm. So you plant your seed, you uh, cultivate it, you water it, you work hard, and in the fall of life, mm -hmm. you harvest. And now you agree to pay tax on what you sell your harvest for. Mm -hmm. That's a traditional IRA 401k pension profit sharing plan. You get a tax break on the seed money, it accumulates tax deferred, and then you're supposed to take it out and pay tax on it on the back end. It's the best savings bond the uh, government ever came up with for themselves. Well. See. People don't realize uh, Uncle Sam has a permanent tax lien mm -hmm. on that tax-deferred IRA or 401k. So it's not all your money. Right. So uh, when people would come to me, uh, and I've coached many successful entrepreneurs and doctors and dentists and orthodontists and chiropractors mm -hmm. and also realtors and CPAs and tax attorneys, and they would come in and they would almost thump themselves on the chest, okay? Well, I got a million bucks here in my IRA. And I go, well, that's not all your money. I, I ask you to bring your after-tax IRA 401k statements. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if I've ever gotten one of those. Oh, let me uh, calculate that for you. <laughs> See, this million isn't all your money. Only about 650,000 of it is yours. Wow. See, if you have a million bucks, and uh, you are earning, you think you can earn 10%? Yeah. Well, so 10% on a million, you should be able to pull out 100 grand a year into perpetuity and never deplete the million bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so you pull out 100,000 and all of a sudden you owe tax of um, 25,000 or 30,000. Mm -hmm. So you only have 70,000 left over to buy gas, groceries, prescriptions, golf green fees. Well, I needed 100. So you go back for the, the 30,000 you were short because you paid tax. Okay, now I got that 30 and you go, hold on, hold on. No, Uncle Sam's gonna take 10 of that 30,000. So you only have 20, so you're still 10,000 short. You go back again and you pull out another 10 and, and they take 3,500 of that and you're going back and forth. And you go, well, 
this is stupid. How much should I have pulled out in the first place to net, you know, 70,000? Well, you should have pulled out probably about 150 grand, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you pull out 150, you pay tax, let's say of a third of 50, you're to net 100. Mm -hmm. At a 10% rate of return, Patrick, mm -hmm. that million dollar nest egg will be totally gone, drained dry in 11 years. Wow. If that million dollars were tax free, you pull out 100,000. The IRS knows you're receiving it. My clients know they receive 100,000, but it's not deemed earned, passive, or portfolio income. Right. Those are the only three types of income since 1986 that are taxable on a 1040 tax return. So it's not a tax loophole, but if you pull out 100 out of my favorite vehicle, which I call the laser fund, mm -hmm. which is the title of my most recent book, uh, you pull it out and it's tax free. So you can spend the whole 100 grand so in 11 years, when people with the same million bucks don't have anything left, and guess what life expectancy is now for a baby boomer couple? It's going to be in the low 80s? Or? Uh, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. You know, back when the Industrial Revolution came out and uh, they retired worn-out equipment, okay, and then they started to retire worn-out people. Right. See? People used to never retire. Mm -hmm. See, I hate the word retire. Yeah. It means put out of use. Right. <laughs> so when people were put out of use, they retired, the life expectancy was only seven years. Mm -hmm. For a military retiree, only five years. So the whole social security system was designed never to have to pay benefits for more than an average of seven years. Right. And that's one of the reasons we're $130 trillion in debt in, in uh, social security uh, liabilities or obligations that the government hasn't collected yet. Okay. Yeah. Now, the point is this. Um, when you uh, live to be now a baby boomer couple, one of you will make it to probably 95 or 96. Mm -hmm. So if you're out of money, let's say you retired at 65 and your traditional accounts because you've been taxed to death, plus inflation's cutting the value of that in half every seven to 10 years. Mm -hmm. If you're out of money in 11 years at age 76 and you're gonna live to 96, that's 20 years now you're going to rely on what? Social Security, welfare, or your children for support? Right. No, who wants to do that? Right. If you had a nest egg that could generate 100 grand a year tax-free, it doesn't deplete your principal. That's 20 more years of 100 grand. That's mm -hmm. 2 million. Right. And you still have your principal of a million. So what I would do is help a lot of people not outlive their money by switching or doing a strategic rollout mm -hmm. from things like IRAs or 401ks with a three-part strategy. Let's get it out of there. Let's get the taxes over and done with sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Because two things are certain. Money will never be worth more than it is today mm -hmm. because of inflation, government spending, and so forth. And number two, your current tax bracket is likely the lowest bracket you will ever be in. So why do you want to postpone tax defer it to some future perceived unknown advantage, and then take out your money when you're convinced taxes are not going to be lower. And, and that's the big lie, isn't it, about, as you said earlier, is that you know, your taxes are going to be lower in the future, so you know, accumulate your money now, and then you're going to pay less tax. But is, it, is the tax in the future, you know, uh, whatever that future is, um, is it based on the amount of money you're pulling out, the amount of income you're making now, or, or is that seen as income when you're pulling it out? Like, why is, it, why is the tax bracket going to be high in the future? Good question. It's because a lot of people have been going down the highway of life, mm -hmm. trying to achieve financial independence with one foot on the gas pedal mm -hmm. and the other foot on the brake pedal. Does that sound smart? Let me explain it. So people think I'm going to use 100 cent tax favor dollars on the seed money, mm -hmm. traditional IRAs, 401ks, because I'm going to be in a lower bracket because I'll be earning less. Let's right. say, a, let's take a school teacher, for example. A school teacher, typically in most states, if they taught school for 30 years, uh, they will get under the state pensions 2% for every year of service they taught school. Mm -hmm. So if you taught school for 30 years, 30 times 2% is 60%. Let's say a school teacher uh, retired making um, uh, five grand a month. Mm -hmm. Well, they're only going to get 3000 a month on their defined benefit pension. Mm -hmm. And they go, well, I can't handle that. So what do they do? They sock away excess money, which they should in supplemental accounts like IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, tax shelter annuities, and what have you. Mm -hmm. I can count on my hand the number of people who were in lower tax brackets when they retired. If you're in a lower bracket, it means you didn't save very much. Mm -hmm. So what happens is... The other foot on the brake pedal 
is they kill their deductions while they're doing it. Mm. So most people pay off their house. You don't have that tax deduction anymore. Uh, they're not contributing money in retirement to IRAs, 401ks, and 403bs. You don't have that deduction anymore. The kids are gone. Or if they're not gone, you can't deduct them anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay? Or um, if they're a business owner, you don't have those deductions anymore. And Congress keeps raising taxes yeah. over and over again. So that's what I mean. You were, had one foot on the gas pedal trying to save and defer to a future date when you thought you were going to be in a lower bracket. And then you hit retirement and all your deductions are gone because you had the other foot on the brake pedal. Mm. And then people pull out that money and they have to pay tax. And so many times people don't need their money, but at age 70 and a half, mm -hmm. if you do not withdraw out of an IRA or 401k or any of these plans, uh, at, uh, what the government says you're supposed to based upon your LE, that's life expectancy, mm -hmm. guess what the penalty is? There's a penalty for it? 50%. So if you're supposed you. to pull out, let's say, 50 grand mm -hmm. starting at age 70 and a half, and it goes up each year, okay, 50 grand, and you don't, the penalty is 25,000, 50% of what you should have pulled out, plus you pay full tax on the whole 50. Wow. See, the government wants that money out and tax before you die so they can tax you again when you do die right. because it's the best savings bond they ever came up with for themselves. Wow. And so uh, I would switch that philosophy. So uh, in 1997, under the Taxpayer Relief Act, there was a, a, a senator by the name of Harry Roth. Mm -hmm. okay? And at the time, the government was hard up for money because the government loves to start cashing in and getting their piece of that action. Right. See, if you and I were a, biz a business partnership and um, I come to you and I say, Patrick, Okay, this is the deal. We're going to go into a partnership together. Now, you're going to do all the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're going to build this business, and I own a third. Okay, I'm a third partner in this thing. Mm -hmm. And here's the deal. Um, if you sell out or, or try to get out of this partnership prematurely, uh, I'm going to uh, get my third and, and penalize you 10% on top of that. Mm -hmm. See, an IRA or 401k, you, you, you're penalized 10% if you touch it before age 59 and a half. Right. Um, but down the road, when you begin to liquidate the business, I get a third of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you don't sell it uh, by the time I want you to, then I'm going to penalize you 50%. And by the way, I reserve the right to change the percentage if I feel like I'm more hard up than you. I can change my percentage to more than a third up to 40% and, and force you to pay me more. Uh, is, that, is that a good partnership? I, so, you're, first of all, I had no idea that they could change it on you, meaning that you could you could have planned for decades, and then they can just change it, and there goes they your plan. They can change, well, government changes tax rates all the time. Right. They can change the percentage they want. They can change when they have you access and so forth. Wow. And, and people go, I would never go into a partnership like that. Wow. And if they haven't got it yet, I go, I just described an IRA or 401k to you. Yeah, but, and that particular partner also has a gun. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> Pointed right. at you. That's so right. You have to go into that partnership if so, you want to do that, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. let's go back to this 1997. Yeah. Right. The government, when they're hard up for money, mm -hmm. uh, they come up with all these ideas. Now, this was a, a, a step in the right direction, but they didn't do it for us. Right. They did it for them. Right. Harry Roth says, well, let's tap into people's IRAs or 401ks sooner than when they retire. Mm -hmm. uh, people are getting smart. Most people would rather just pay tax on the seed money, mm -hmm. accumulate it tax-free, and then access, harvest the money tax-free. Right. And we'll name it after me, <laughs> a Roth. And we'll get a windfall of uh, revenue. See, these are revenueers. And we'll get a whole bunch of revenue because people will convert from regular IRAs or 401ks to Roths because they'll, they'll realize they're not going to be in a lower tax bracket. Right. Now, that may be smart, uh, and so a Roth has two advantages. Mm -hmm. uh, you actually pay tax on the seed, which I think is better. Right. And it accumulates tax-free. And when you retire, you take it out tax-free. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so it triggered a lot of tax revenue for the government, and that's why they did it. And then later on, they needed more. And so they came up with a Roth 401k. Mm -hmm. Now, Patrick, I've never owned an IRA or 401k or a Roth. I never will. I, I want so I want to make this real. So here you are, a financial strategist. You give advice to 
very wealthy people, mm-hmm. and and you're saying personally, you've never owned a Roth IRA, a traditional IRA, a That's 401k. Right. Now tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> because um, a lot of times, what I own, which I call the laser fund, is called by CPAs and tax attorneys the rich man's Roth. Mm -hmm. And I snicker because you don't have to be rich to own one of these, but the rich can't own own an IRA or 401k. They make too much money, see? And so a Roth or a traditional, if you make too much money, you can't participate. Uh, They restrict how much you can contribute Mm -hmm. or a percent of your income. You can't touch it till age 59 and a half. You must start taking it up by age 70 and a half or it's a 50% penalty. All these strings are attached. I don't like those. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have my own private um, rich man's Roth, so to speak. That's not what it's really called in the Internal Revenue Code. But there's no restriction on what I can put into my accounts. Mm -hmm. If I have a banner year, I could throw in 200, 300, 400 grand, because I have a lot of clients that do have windfalls or they Mm -hmm. sell uh, property or business or real estate or what have you. And uh, if you don't have any money, you don't have to contribute it. Mm-hmm. If I put in money and a week later I have an emergency, I can pull out 70, 80, 90% of it. You can't do that with a Roth. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to wait five years or until you're 59 and a half. But the third benefit, besides having all that flexibility, because I have a beatitude, mm-hmm. a personal, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. Okay? okay? <laughs> yes. I don't want to be bent out of shape right. when, when these topsy-turvy things happen in the world. But the uh, third thing is, <clears throat> every million dollars mm-hmm. that I have in my laser fund, if I died mm-hmm. tomorrow, would blossom to two and a half million instantly and transfer to my family bank. You don't know what that is, but mm-hmm. I want to talk about it. Uh, to my heirs, my, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, uh, my charities. It two and a half times itself instantly tax-free and transfers without a tax event. And a Roth will not do that. Mm-hmm. And I actually earn rates of return that are about 2% higher than normal Roths. I've been averaging 10.07% for the last 25 years tax-free. Wow. So what is this fund then? Okay. In the Internal Revenue Code Mm -hmm. for over a century, since before the code, um, there's only one financial vehicle Mm -hmm. that allows a person to accumulate their money Mm tax-free. You have to put in after-tax dollars. I help my clients get tax deductions indirectly, okay? Mm -hmm. That's another topic. And then uh, you accumulate your money tax-free, and then when you take it out, you can take it out Mm tax-free. You don't have to wait till you're 59 and a half. It doesn't matter if you're 100. It's tax-free, period, if you follow what the code says, okay? And three, when you die, it increases in value instantly. It blossoms and transfers tax-free, okay? And that's not a municipal bond. Mm -hmm. It is deemed a max-funded, Mm maximum-funded, tax-advantaged insurance contract. Most people, when they hear that, they go, what? I've never heard of that. I've never seen an insurance contract that has a decent rate of return. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, so you think they don't exist? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen your brain before? (laughs) (laughs) How do you know that exists? I go, what kind of reason is that, you know? I go, actually, uh, I have thousands of clients, and I've been doing this for 45 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a nutshell, Mm -hmm. this was the brainchild of E.F. Hutton. Mm -hmm. I won't go into a long history, but Hutton... You know, they were selling stocks, bonds, mutual funds, but they realized that in the Internal Revenue Code was this magic instrument that allowed you to accumulate access and transfer money totally tax-free, and and that was under insurance because insurance was a sacred cow. Mm -hmm. Uh, In other words, you don't want to tax people who are putting money into something that's going to take pressure off of the government, Mm -hmm. uh, welfare for widows and orphans and so forth. So if somebody wants to be responsible and accountable, Mm -hmm. and they want to insure themselves, let's say with life insurance, they want to insure themselves for a million bucks so that if I die, Mm -hmm. my widow that I leave behind and my kids won't be a drain on society and, and so forth. So why should we penalize people that are taking pressure off the government? They're taking ownership for their own future. Right. In fact, that's one of the things I teach. When you take ownership and take pressure off the government, uh, you get tax benefits. Mm-hmm. That's why IRAs or 401ks are 
tax advantaged mm -hmm. because you're hopefully not going to rely on the government as much for your later years. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why this is tax-free. What Hutton realized is that most people, and they were the ones that were proponents, okay, you just buy insurance and, and invest the difference. You know, it's like buy term insurance, invest the difference. And they were investing the, the difference in their stocks and bonds and mutual funds. But back uh, at the time, mm -hmm. if you earn 12%, did you ever play uh, red light, green light when you were a child? Sure. Yeah, like Simon says. Okay. So <clears throat> let's say you're playing red light, green light, and you're in this mutual fund portfolio. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a series one securities license. I had over 3,000 clients in mutual funds. Mm -hmm. They were never happier than when I got them out of the market and into these. So you play red light, green light. Some years in the market, you might make 20%. So you take 20 steps forward. Okay. And uh, the next period, uh, it loses 12%. So you take 12 steps back. Mm -hmm. And then uh, eight steps forward, and then so many steps back, and so forth. Well, what Hutton and these brokerage firms are trying to do mm -hmm. is average 12, a net of 12 positive steps forward. Mm -hmm. It's not happening. Right. But let's assume you could. You take 12 steps forward, but let's say you have that million dollar nest egg we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking 12 steps forward, you're earning 12%. You don't get to keep all that money. You pull out 120 grand and you got to take four steps back in tax. Right. You got you go 40,000 in tax. You take another step back in fees. You take 12 steps forward, five steps back every time you withdraw money for retirement. Mm -hmm. You're only netting 7% if you're lucky. The sad thing is Dalbar, who is uh, a, an analyst of people's behavior in the stock market, they said, if you just bought and held, uh, like Warren Buffett suggests, uh, you probably average 9.14%. Mm -hmm. You earn 90,000 on a million, you pull it out, you only net 60. Mm -hmm. Do you know what most investors average in the market in some of the most incredible periods like 1990 to 2000, when you could have thrown a dart at a dartboard made up of newspaper clippings of stocks and you would have earned 12.9? You know what most Americans earned in the market? How much? 3.9. Because they were buying and selling at the wrong time. Wow. Emotion enters in. And the market starts to go down. And, and, and they hang on and their advisor goes, hang in there, hang in there. The market always comes back. And so finally, when it's about a 40% drop, they they, they've lost it. Mm -hmm. And so they pull out and they sell. <laughs> and then they will not buy back in again until the market's back up here. Mm -hmm. So they're buying and selling at the wrong times. And so Dalbar says the average uh, investor really earns about 3.49%. This is what precipitated what is called the 4% rule in the financial services industry. Have you ever heard of that? No. 4% rule says this. If people's emotions involved only really is giving them about three and a half percent return on mm -hmm. the money. Uh, a fiduciary, a licensed advisor, is never supposed to recommend or illustrate a payout at retirement more than four percent without the client signing a waiver saying they will not sue you if they outlive their money. Because mm. if you're earning three and a half and you're pulling out Four, mm -hmm. it's going to slowly deplete, but not before your LE. That's called the 4% rule. Uh -huh. Patrick, on max funded insurance contracts, I have earned over 45 years an average of 8.2%. Wow. Uh, the last 25 years, I've er uh, averaged 10.07 tax free. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a cost, but it's not taxes. If I earn 10, I net 9. If I earn like last year, uh, we're referring to the year uh, 2017 was a heyday. Mm -hmm. I locked in gains of 25% on my max funded insurance portfolio, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it's other 16. What do I mean by locked in? 2018 was sort of flat. I mean, people, many people lost. I didn't lose a dime. My clients never lost the 25% they locked in the year before because your money's not in the market, it's linked to the market. Mm -hmm. It's called indexing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so sometimes zero, getting a zero rate of return is hero. Mm -hmm. So let me give you the worst decade since the Great Depression, mm -hmm. 2000 to 2010. Let's even go to 2012, here's why. Let's say you had a million dollar nest egg in the year 2000, mm -hmm. okay. And you're thinking I can retire and 
take out maybe 75,000 a year, even though you only net 50,000 in a 33% bracket. What happened in 2001? 9-11. Mm -hmm. Now, from 2001 to 2003, people saw that nest egg they had taken their entire lifetime to accumulate, dropped from a million bucks down to 600,000. Mm -hmm. They felt like they had lost their future. Mm -hmm. They had to put off retirement seven years. It took four more years to make back that loss to a million to break even again in the year 2007. Then, in one single year, mm -hmm. 2008, they lost 40% again for the second time in a decade. Mm -hmm. It took until 2012 to come back to break even to a million. We call it the lost decade. Mm -hmm. People that had max funded insurance contracts, my clients, they were almost cheering, uh, not because of the terrorist attacks at all. No, mm -hmm. not because of that, of but because when the market went down in 2008, they were going, go, go, mm -hmm. go, because they weren't losing. Right. Uh, and you'll start making money again much faster after it bottoms out because you'll start making money again here instead of losing. So you don't lose when the market goes down and you start making money again. What's the trade-off? Mm -hmm. A cap. The cap last year was 25%. If the market does more than 25, you only get up to 25. Or another one might be 16 or 12. So you have a cap on the most that you can earn, but you have a floor you will never lose. I mean, Patrick, I have not put a nickel in a slot machine in Vegas for 35 years. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you a question. If you walked into some casino and they said, Patrick, welcome. We're going to give you uh, some chips here. And uh, here's the deal. We have a special little guest table over here. We want you to have fun. So every day um, as you play, uh, you can keep up to 100% of all the money you make up to a cap of 15% per day. Mm -hmm. okay. But we do guarantee this, that if you lose, that you will walk out of this casino every day with what you walked in with. I'm not a gambler. Well, I'd I would, probably I play would show that up one. every day. Yeah, well, that's not gambling. <laughs> it's not gambling. Yeah, yeah. See, that's what I do for my clients. That's mm -hmm. called indexing. Mm -hmm. Indexing is not a product. It's a strategy. And, and just to be strategy. clear, so there's such a thing as an upside with no downside. Yeah. Well, the downside is you might not earn anything, but you won't lose. But that's not, yeah. As I yeah. Saying, you know, it, it, it and so the upside, the upside is capped, but mm -hmm. the downside means there's a floor. But a cap at 25% is, uh, is, is like no cap at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And not all of yeah. them. I have a diversified portfolio. Some have caps of 12, mm -hmm. some 16, some 25. Mm. And that's where uh, I have earned many, many uh, years up to the cap. Mm -hmm. Other years, I haven't. But the average has been 10.07. The cost of the insurance that the IRS says has to be there mm -hmm. or it won't be tax-free under the code uh, usually uses about 1%. But actually... This is strange. The older you get, the cheaper it becomes. That seems counterintuitive. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Do you want me to explain why? It's because you're paying it along the way? Yeah, because when E.F. Hutton came up with the, this idea, they realized that the multi-trillion dollar insurance industry is not only the backbone of America, but the world, okay? Uh, in, in fact, one of the companies where I put my money, I, I'm very picky. There's over 2,000 legal reserve insurance companies in the United States. Legal reserve, they, these are the ones that through the Great Depression came through with flying colors when 40% of banks never opened their doors again. Mm -hmm. Some real estate dropped 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, these insurance companies back in the Depression maybe continue to pay 2 or 3%. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 2008, people don't know how serious of shape we were in in this yeah. country. And so when the mortgage meltdown happened and all this, uh, the federal government asked the five major banks in America to disclose where they had their tier one assets mm -hmm. for liquidity and safety. Mm -hmm. Guess where they had 30 to 40% of their tier one assets. This is money you have to have liquid on hand safe in the event of a run on the bank. B-O-L-I, BOLI, bank owned life insurance contracts. Mm. What? On who? Doesn't matter. They own insurance on their president, their board of directors, their stockholders. It's the owner of the insurance contract that gets all the tax-free accumulation and tax-free access. Uh -huh. Now, if there's insurance, you want to put it on somebody close to you. So, you know, my clients would put it on themselves or their spouse or their children. I have several of these. My wife does. I own them on my 
children, my children own them on me, mm. which will knock the socks off of any IRA or 401k, mm -hmm. okay? I tell my kids or my wife, try to look down and look sad at my funeral, because you're going to be loaded. <laughs> you know, that's more of a no, it's not about the death benefit, even mm. though the death benefit is tax-free. Mm -hmm. It's because of the inside accumulation. So simply, Hutton said, instead of trying to get this much insurance, let's say, for the least amount of premium that pays off when you die, mm -hmm. let's use this also, or even more so, as a living benefit. Let's take the least amount of insurance the IRS will let you get away with mm -hmm. and put in the most money, and it turns into a cash cow. And you're, so basically, you're overfunding the insurance policy. You're way overfunding. And people say, why would you do that? Because the insurance company then receives your money, and it's way more money than they need for your chance of dying. That's called the mortality cost. Right. And so you have all this cash in there in their general account portfolio. And it's just sitting there. And uh, so what happens is when the insurance company goes out and puts your money to work, they are earning rates of return on AAA and AA bonds and mortgages on shopping malls and skyscrapers where they only loan about 50 or 60% loan to value. Mm -hmm. This is why there's never been a legal reserve insurance company ever, ever not honor a legitimate claim because not only do they have a lot of liquidity and safety, but they cross-insure each other. It's way mm -hmm. better than FDIC, in my opinion. Wow. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's why they weathered the Great Depression in 2008. So what you're doing, Hutton said, let's bypass the middleman. Mm -hmm. You put your money in there. Now, when this first came out, I had 3,000 clients in mutual funds. This was 1980. Mm -hmm. My clients were never happier because I got them out. And back then, for over 10 years, in their insurance contract, they were earning between 11 and three quarters and 15 and a half percent. Let's just use 11. So let's go back to red light, green light. Mm -hmm. They were walking 11 steps and only one step back. That wasn't tax. That was the cost of the insurance mm -hmm. that the IRS said had to be there, or it would move from section 72E and 7702 of the Internal Revenue Code tax-free insurance mm -hmm. over to the investment part of the code that is taxable. Mm. To stay under the definition of tax-free insurance, you have to have a commensurate amount of insurance coming along for the ride. Mm -hmm. So if I had a half a million, mm -hmm. and I had many clients back in 1980, they would drop in a half a million bucks. They were earning 11, mm -hmm. netting 10. Mm -hmm. So if they were retired, they could pull out 50 grand a year tax-free. Pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm. So they're earning 11 but netting 10. That 1% was paying for the insurance, but when, if they died, the 500,000 blossomed to a million too. You know what's interesting, Patrick? We don't object to insurance benefits. Mm. <laughs> I've never had a widow or a widower turn down an insurance. Oh, no, no, I don't want the check. No, we object to paying for it. Mm. So from what I've just said, if you're earning 11 and netting 10, and that 1% is paying for insurance that will take your half million and blossom it to a, a million 250 in this example, mm -hmm. that wasn't a cost, that was a benefit. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, people say, Doug, how can you afford all that life insurance? I go, well, because I'm technically not paying for it. Uncle Sam's paying for it. What do you mean? Well, it's being paid for with otherwise payable income tax. To net 10%, after tax, mm -hmm. I would have to earn 15 or 16 percent in my tax bracket mm -hmm. in a mutual fund portfolio to net 10, earn 15, net 10, because a third of it belongs to Uncle Sam. I can more conservatively, more predictably earn 11 and net 10 mm -hmm. in the insurance contract because they don't mess around with my money in the stock market. And I'm saying you're not at risk, like you would. They're not at risk. Any others, yeah. Because what's happening? I mentioned indexing. So every year I have the choice. If I leave my money in the insurance company that I've overfunded, and uh, most insurance companies have had a general account portfolio yield the last uh, few years of about 5%, okay? It's because of the lower rates on mortgages and what have you. Now, I can just choose any time I want, just pay me the 5%. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, so on a million bucks, they would credit me 50 grand. And that's what I would do if I felt bearish about America this year. Mm -hmm. But if I feel, feel bullish, mm -hmm. I go, okay, I think the economy is going to grow more than 5%. So you can opt to link some or all of, let's say I have a million in there, mm -hmm. 
I can link some or all of that million to an index or indes, indices mm -hmm. of my choice. Mm -hmm. The six companies where I put my money, and by the way, one of them manages two and a half trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. You know how much money that is? A lot of money. That's as much as the IRS collects in income taxes in a single year. Right. One insurance company, okay? Wow. Wow. They're pretty big. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> that um, money that I link over there, then they offer different indexes. Let's say the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones or the Russell 2000, or they have an exclusive on what is called the BUDB, mm -hmm. the Barclays, U.S. Dynamic Balance Index. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they say, oh, so you're relinquishing the for sure 5%. Yep. You can do whatever you want with that 50 grand that you're earning on my million this year. Mm -hmm. But don't put my million principal at risk. That must stay safe mm -hmm. in your insurance company. Okay. What do they do with the 50,000? They buy upside options in the S&P or the Dow Jones or whatever. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. They're the number one purchaser of options in the world, which means this. If the uh, S&P was up 10%, then it's very easy for them to pay me 10% instead of 5%, 100 grand instead of 50 grand, because the options matured. Right. If it goes up 15, it's very easy for that 50,000 to triple to 150. But they have to cap it based upon the price of options at maybe 15 or 16 or 20 or 25%. The trade-off is, if the economy tanks like 2008, and everybody else in America that had their money in the market, mm -hmm. their million would have dropped to 600,000. Mm -hmm. I didn't lose a dime because I relinquished the 50. The right. options expired worthless. Right. I was going to say, you just don't exercise the option. You're at zero. Yeah. I, I, I end up with my million, but I didn't lose. See, right. sometimes zero is hero. Right. When you do that, and if you study the market, I know that most of the time, 70% of the time, the market's going to be up. Okay. And only 30% of the time, the market is going to be down. And I will always earn 2 to 4% more than the general account portfolio rate that the insurance company is earning. Mm. Banks do this. Mm. Patrick, I'm writing a book called How Money Really Works. We put our money in a bank, and they were only paying us like 1%. Mm -hmm. So you can do four things with money. You can spend it, lend it, own with it, or give it away. Mm -hmm. So when money is in a bank credit union or an insurance company, it's in a lended position. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Why are they borrowing our money and paying us interest? Are they just a benevolent institution? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, not, yeah. What are they doing with our money? They're borrowing our money a million bucks and paying us 10 grand. Now in 2008, they disclosed right off the bat, they're taking 30 to 40% of their tier one assets and they're turning around with that money and guess where they're putting it? Right where I just told you, right. in the insurance company. Because the insurance companies are usually rated triple A, mm. the ones I put my money in. A lot of banks are only, only rated triple B. So they borrow our money at 1%, put it into uh, an institution ranked six notches higher in safety, and they're earning 5%. How much more is five than one? Four. No, it's 500%. How so? Would you hire an employee for 10000 that made you an extra 50000 Sure. That's called a 500% return on employment cost if you're a business owner. Mm -hmm. Would you buy a widget machine for 10 grand if that widget machine made you an extra 50 grand? Of course. It's 500%, not 4%. Wow. <laughs> Does it, you get it? Yes. And they're doing it on OPM, other people's money. All I tell my clients is you can bypass the middleman. You can take your money, increase the liquidity and the safety and the rate of return, and you could be earning 10 tax free. So this is then the real business of the banks is what you're saying. You have not making money on mortgages and some loans or what other things they might do, which is a part of their, but really their biggest business is what you're describing. Patrick, the banks could do far better if they did not loan one dime to the public, but they can't get away with doing that or people would stop bringing money to deposit it into the bank. But the bank can more predictably and safely borrow our money and put it into these types of instruments but it's also the velocity of money. Mm -hmm. So I often ask my audiences, why in the world would a bank or credit union who can borrow our money at 1% and they can turn around and earn five times that ta tax free right. ever want to loan you or me a million dollars to go buy a home or something like that? And people go, well, be because they have to? No, there's no regulation that says they have to. 
I mean, if we didn't give them the money, maybe uh, they, we, we would stop doing that, right. but that's not the reason. So if I go to a bank and I borrow a million dollars to go build a house, what am I gonna do with the million? I'm going to give it to the general contractor. Right. What's the general contractor gonna do? Take his piece, pay his subs mm -hmm. and the suppliers. Mm -hmm. What are all of them now gonna do? Loan that million dollars back to the bank again. It goes right back into the banks. The banks get it back in a week or so at 1% or less if it's a checking account. They get it back again and they loan it back out again at five, at 500%. Mm -hmm. The average bank will loan out and receive back, okay? They'll do that 17 times. They'll turn over the same money 17 times a year, only 12 times a year in a recession. Shucky darn. So see, they can afford to take risks that if I uh, lose my job and they have to foreclose, they don't want to foreclose on my house, but they, they've calculated that in there. But if they can borrow OPM, other people's money at 1% and loan it back out again at 5%, five times, 17 times a year on the same money, that's called the velocity of money. Wow. So this, is, this really starts to sound like a racket. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the banking industry, but it's not new. This is the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 in the, in the New Testament. This has been around for millennia. Wow. So you, know, you illustrated so well as far as you know, the, um, the uh, analogies that you, that you weave into it so that it's something tangible to us lay people you know, that go out <laughs> and work every day and, uh, and not see this, you know, this, this sort of uh, look behind the curtain. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's so when you start to look at okay, so we got banks, you know, we got the government, you know, and we see, you know, how literally, I don't know that I'm gonna say it's totally malevolent, but it seems like it's rigged against producers, right? Uh, you know that that the, the system is, you know, that these people are locked in and they enslave the producers. Uh, in the ways that they, with inflation, with taxes, et cetera, with the relending of your of your money, uh, you know, because if I buy, like you said, if I borrow the money and I go build the house and something happens to me, I'm at risk. Then next thing you know, maybe I'm bankrupted in the house. But they don't care because that money is trickled back to them over and over again, oh, seventeen yeah. times. Yeah. So where could I get into that business? <laughs> right. You know? Well, in a lot of my books, I talk about how to become your own banker. Right. Okay. I'll give you a little taste. Mm -hmm. For example, in my max funded insurance contracts, let me use an example of an actual friend, a client of mine who is a real estate developer, okay? What he does is he buys uh, strip malls, uh, large apartment complexes mm -hmm. that uh, people want out of. He will fix them up and then flip them to somebody. He doesn't like to keep them and be a landlord. Right. So he has a pool of investors looking for fixed up properties mm -hmm. and he goes out and finds the distressed properties. So where he keeps his working capital is where I do in my insurance contracts because mm -hmm. it's very liquid. You can access your money with an elect electronic funds transfer or phone call. Okay, so many times he might call and he'll say, Doug, I need a million bucks out of my insurance contract to uh, tie up an earnest money agreement on a $30 million project I'm gonna buy. I go, great, uh, how soon do you need it? And if it's a week or so, uh, we can just do it normal, but he mm -hmm. says, I need it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. In the insurance contract, he can get that electronically. We can overnight it or whatever. Now, he says, send me the form. <clears throat> it's one page. He puts his name. He puts his account number or policy number at the mm -hmm. top. He's going to uh, sign it on the bottom. He doesn't have to have his signature notarized mm -hmm. unless it's going to a different bank account or address than on record. Mm -hmm. And the one sentence, the one question that he must answer is, do you want to withdraw a million out of your insurance con contract, or would you like to borrow a million? Mm. Guess which box he checks. Borrow. That's right. Yeah. Here's why. If he withdrew the million, the million that is, and he's been averaging about 10% like me. So if he withdrew it to do this, and he didn't pay it back for a year, he would relinquish $100,000 of interest, uh, 10 grand on that million. Right. He doesn't have to do that. So he, ke he keeps the full principal balance for, uh, for his rate of return and yet still has access to capital to be able to do his... Yeah, in other words, project. let's say you went to a bank to borrow money and they said, well, uh, you have a savings, a CD here. You can use that as collateral and we'll loan you the money. But right. see, the banks will loan you at five and they'll only pay you one. Right. No, this is different. With the insurance contract, the insurance company says, oh, heavens, yeah, uh, we'll loan you the equivalent 
of your cash value in here. Because And so you'll just leave it here and we'll keep crediting you with this indexed return. Mm. And we'll loan you a million. Mm. They guarantee to never charge you more than 5% with this particular company that he has. And he's okay? making 10% on it. How much more is 10 than 5? Well, five times. Well, five percent no, no, more. No, that's a hundred percent more. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay, so you're doubling it. Yeah, five percent so more. But he's uh, pulling yeah. it out. The, he doesn't have to write out a check to pay the interest. The insurance company charges fifty grand at the end of the year, and they credited him a hundred. He made a net of fifty grand. He made a net of five percent tax free on his money while he was using it on top of what he was doing. So, is this the best kept secret in the financial world? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, well, is, see, is that see, what you, you were you were asking? How can the little guy do it? Right. Last year, he borrowed at 5% mm -hmm. and earned 25% on the money that he borrowed because he didn't actually withdraw. So he was earning 25, it only cost him five. So he netted 20% tax-free on his money while he was buying real estate. So this is, so it's literal when you say be, be your own bank. You get, exactly. to be, you get to be in the business yourself of banking your own money rather than using these banks, which are just, you know, <laughs> oh, uh, pillaging. You do this to buy cars or anything or yeah. businesses. This is where I have my working capital for my business. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, a lot of people don't know what they don't know. And this is why I write the books. And sometimes it goes over people's heads mm -hmm. and even financial advisors don't get it. Mm -hmm. Most people, when they came to me, it was through the financial dimension is what I call it. Mm -hmm. But Patrick, it's not just about the money. Mm -hmm. So. When I would sit down with people and I would uh, tell them what I did, okay, I help people optimize assets. Mm -hmm. But when we say the word assets, what kinds of things do most people think of first? Money. Yeah. yeah. Real estate, stocks, bonds, mm -hmm. real estate, mutual funds. and Those are just things. Mm -hmm. Those are just material possessions. So mm -hmm. they're the financial assets. But then I would ask them, what are the most important assets mm -hmm. that you value, that you cherish, that you possess on this earth? Family. Family. Mm -hmm health, mm -hmm. uh, values. Uh, these assets involve people. The, these are human assets. They are our core assets. And so I put the, these under the foundational assets for abundant living. It would include your talents, unique abilities, charitable foundations, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. There's a third dimension of authentic wealth is what I call it. It's our intellectual assets. Wisdom is a product of knowledge times experiences, right. and not just the good ones. I've actually learned more from my bad experiences in life. It would include your formal education, reputation, systems, methods, traditions, alliances, ideas, and skills. Mm -hmm. So these are the three dimensions of authentic wealth. Uh, these are like the three uh, satellites in the GPS of every one of our souls, mm -hmm. see? Because if you're gonna be going on a trip somewhere for the very first time, when using a GPS, mm -hmm. it uses triangulation. And it does that by honing in on three out of about 30 satellites that orbit this earth for that very purpose. Once it has clarity mm -hmm. on where you are at within two square feet on this globe, then you program in where you're wanting to go. Mm -hmm. It'll show you all kinds of ways to get to your desired destination. Mm -hmm. So when people would come to me, what they really wanted to know is, can I have the lifestyle I want? They were thinking it was a money equation. Mm -hmm. okay? And so it was like a three-legged stool, but they were coming all too often wobbling on one of the legs. Mm. Uh, maybe they had accumulated their financial wealth at the expense of their health. And now they were gonna spend all their wealth trying to regain their health, which is really silly. Or they had accumulated their financial wealth at the expense of relationships with mm. their spouse, their kids, their grandkids, or their God. And they were wondering, what was all this for at the end of the day? I'm not gonna take any of this money with me. There's no luggage racks on hearses, as mm -hmm. the song says. I mean. Two affluent guys died and went to the pearly gates. One turned to the other and said, man, how much did you leave behind? <laughs> the other one said, all of it. <laughs> yeah, you don't take it with you. Right. And, uh, and so they thought that um, uh, they were empowering their children when, the, no, they were giving them handouts. Mm -hmm. and, and See, a lot of these people would come and their kids were sort of born on third base mm -hmm. and grew up thinking they hit a triple. Right, right. right. And they were sitting around, when do I get my share? Can I have what you pay for? And they were building them out of their problems. Mm -hmm. And they went to an attorney and they would have a trust. And I would say, well, let's look at your trust. And um, let me guess, this is probably what it went like. You, you went in and about 15 minutes, there was small talk. And then the attorney said, okay, now you want to be fair, don't you? <laughs> and they go, yeah. You want to divide this up equally, don't you? 
And, and as soon as the attorney gets you nodding, he goes, hot diggity dog, I got another one. And he takes your kid's names, plugs, plugs it into this boilerplate document, uh, and it's going to be divided up equally among your kids when you pass away, sometimes requiring to kill the goose laying the golden egg, uh, the, the business or the apartments or the assets when it's not a good time to sell. And then it gets dumped in their laps and mm. it ruins half of the kids in this country. Mm. Oh, when do I get my share? Mm. It's called equal distribution trusts. Mm. Patrick, there's nothing more unequal than the equal distribution to unequals. Yeah. Now, people hear that, and they go, huh? I'm going, okay, our creator, whatever your belief is of a higher power, does not give equal distribution of blessings, of health, let's say, to all of us, regardless of how some of us may choose to abuse our body. Mm -hmm. Our creator gives us equal opportunities, okay? You do this, this, and this, then you will reap this type of health or blessing or whatever. Uh, he just doesn't hand out blessings to all of us, regardless of, of how we do things. So why do you want your trust to do that? So I would help them set up their trust with equal opportunities instead of equal distribution, and it changes those children and grandchildren to be responsible and accountable. And uh, then they would come in and they would learn, because my two sons, mm -hmm. okay, Emran and Aaron, I didn't give them anything. I didn't pay for their college. My wife and I did not pay for our kids' college education. We gave them equal opportunities, not, but not equal distribution. Because mm -hmm. when I was a kid, uh, and I went to uh, Brigham Young University. I worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken 30 hours a week. My wife worked at a bookstore. Mm -hmm. I got uh, scholarships and grants and loans, but we actually had better study habits mm -hmm. than a lot of our friends whose parents were just shelling it out. Mm -hmm. So when we had our six children, we didn't want any of them to think we would just pay for their college, and we didn't. They had to earn their school clothes. They had to shampoo carpets or paint or whatever. But if they wanted to go on a semester abroad in Israel or Egypt or somewhere, they had to sell their motorcycle, sacrifice, come up with as much skin in the game as they could, mm -hmm. then we might match or we might loan them, and then they would pay it back. So what happened with my six children and my two sons, and I have four daughters, uh, <clears throat> when they learned that, in 2000, after 2001 in particular, 9-11, on family vacations with a purpose, we teach our kids responsibility and accountability. Mm -hmm. And uh, my two sons says, Dad, in your first book, you talk about buying a house with no money down and no credit. It's 9-11. Well, I learned from Richard Rossi, when there's anxiety, there's opportunity. Mm -hmm. I says, it's never been easier to buy a house with no money down and no credit. I gave them the criteria to look for. They came back in two weeks and they had a list of 30 homes that met the criteria. Mm -hmm. And they both bought homes with no money down and no credit within a week. Wow. They began to sock away money in their own max funded insurance contracts. By ages 26 and 28, they had net worth of 1.6 million. Mm. I never gave them a dime. They came in and worked for nothing as like indentured servants the first two years editing my books and so forth. I, they didn't get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. Now, when Time Warner, my publisher, learned that they had net worth of 1.6 million at age 26 and 28, mm -hmm. they told me to put uh, the book I was working on at the moment on the back burner, and they said, we want your sons to write a book, Millionaire by 30. Mm -hmm. How to have your money earning more than you do by age 32. You know why? Because the research we had done showed back then, this was 2008, mm -hmm. that the average college graduate, after going to school and learning how to go out and make a living, mm -hmm. and then nobody taught them what to do with the living. Mm -hmm. And they want to have all the things their parents have soon and so forth, and they were spending, spending, consuming, and what have you. And uh, by age 30, the average net worth of a college graduate in 2008 was only 15,000 mm. bucks. That's pathetic. Your money should be earning more than you do by age 32. So they gave my two sons a $400,000 advance to write the book. That was four times the advance I got for my first book, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so the next family retreat, uh, uh, my kid said, so how do you write a book? And I said, oh, you don't have to be a writer to be an author. And my sons actually wrote that book, Millionaire by 30, uh, from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m on Monday mornings only for 12 weeks, 12 chapters. We put the flesh on the bones and it became a bestseller. But the message here is, Patrick, it's not just for those who are in their 20s. Mm. Yes, the millennials 
need to start socking away money and think twice before just following the herd, putting money in traditional IRAs or 401ks. If they did it, if they started socking away 10 or 20 grand a year in a max funded insurance contract that had 8 million bucks when they were 65. Wow. 8 million, generating 10% payout, eight, uh, 800 grand a year tax free. That'll knock the socks off of any IRA or 401k after tax. Mm -hmm. But we've actually had people take that book, Millionaire by 30, because it starts from scratch. See, most people came to me and they already had some assets they'd accumulated. They just needed to optimize them, save mm -hmm. tax. I've had people in their 50s and 60s read Millionaire by 30 because mm -hmm. they had to start all over again. They just filed bankru bankruptcy. They went through a divorce, started all over. And in 10 years, they had a million dollars. And so it's really understanding how money works and the three marvels or miracles, um, compound interest, tax free mm -hmm. accumulation, not tax deferred, right. and safe positive leverage. The ability to own and control assets with very little or none of your money tied up or at risk in those assets. Would you believe that CPAs and tax attorneys fail a three question exam about compound interest when I give it to them? That would be disturbing. Let me <laughs> tell you one thing I do. Okay. Imagine I've got an eight and a half by 11 sheet of 26 pound copy paper. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's normal copy paper. And I hand it to you, Patrick, and I say, fold it in half. Mm -hmm. Now fold it in half one more time. Mm -hmm. Now you fold it in half twice. Now imagine if you could fold that sheet of copy paper in half a total of 48 more times, 50 times total, okay? Mm -hmm. Now you can't do it because physically because of the right. folds. But imagine if you could fold that sheet of paper in half 48 more times, a total of 50. I ask my audience members, okay, write down on that sheet of paper a guesstimate of about how thick you think that sheet of paper would be. Mm -hmm. And CPAs and tax attorneys go, mm, three-eighths of an inch, <laughs> half an inch, three inches. Some say 12 feet. <laughs> Some say a mile, and they get laughed out of the room. Uh -huh. I go, hold on. I thought you understood compound interest. Mm -hmm. What is the sheet of paper doing every time you fold it in half? It's doubling. Yeah. A sheet of copy paper is five one thousandths of an inch thick. Mm -hmm. Double, 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 double. Do you know, after 20 folds, it's already a mile high. Wow. In 42 folds, it would be from here to the moon. If you could fold it over 50 times, it would be 93 million miles thick from here to the sun. Wow. And I've got savvy people that work with numbers every day that are guessing a half an inch. I'm trying to get them to the sun <laughs> and, because they don't understand compound interest. So it was Einstein that said compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Right. It, was, it was Rothschilds that said, no, compound interest tax free. Do you know if you double a dollar, okay? Just like that sheet of paper, a dollar doubled 20 times is a million dollars if it's tax-free. Mm -hmm. If it's tax is earned in a bank or credit union, in a 25% tax bracket, it's only worth 72,000. From a million to 72,000 is the impact of taxes. Wow. In other words, a dollar doubles to $2. Mm -hmm. Now you pay tax of 25 cents on that gain. So you only, ha you only have a buck 75. Right. The buck 75 doubles to 350, you pay tax on that. In a 25% bracket, you don't have a million, you only have 72 grand. In a 33% bracket, you only have 27,000. When you could have had a million. Wow. So to summarize, where do most people in America put their money? Taxed as earned investments. Mm -hmm. They put it in banks and credit unions. They could have a million and they only have 27,000, for example. That's like crawling around a racetrack. We're going on a million dollar dash here and they're crawling. Mm. If you put it in a tax deferred IRA, oh, Oh, it's tax deferred. I got a million. Mm, no, that's not all your money. Only about 650000 of that is your money. Mm -hmm. Why don't you sprint around that track, put it in something tax-free, okay? Double it in that 20 times. You have a million bucks and it's tax-free, and that'll generate hundred grand a year of tax-free income into perpetuity. And you can put that, that in your family bank, and you let your children and grandchildren access that money with responsibility and accountability with some skin in the game, mm -hmm. and you'll never run out of money. Doug, I feel like I could do an entire docu-series on you. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of places that we can go explore, but I, I think the, um, the view you've given 
um, is something that should be an awakening, uh, which is really a central purpose in, in this particular process, this, this docuseries, is to say that there's so much that we don't understand about money. And, and what we don't understand doesn't just impact us monetarily, it impacts us spiritually, and it impacts yes. our entire human experience here. And it can create great suffering, or it can be great joy if you if you know what you're mm-hmm. doing. I mean, it's it's a you know the the humanistic side of this is is immeasurable. So, uh, but you've now just laid out literally what the predicament is and what the solutions are. And all I can say is uh, I'm going to go out and read all your books. <laughs> right when we're done here, I'm going to encourage others to do the same. And uh, and I just very much appreciate you taking your time to share all this with us. Thank you, Patrick. It's been an honor. To see the next episode in the Money Revealed series, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Amazon is the virtual pipeline. It is the glue that connects every household in the United States. How much money can we make with this thing? And I'm not looking for home runs. I'm looking for base hits.